Hey, hey, hey. Did you know Faith Formula Human Services has an emergency financial assistance program? That's right. We assist with utilities, rent, and even limited mortgage. In the month of March, over 4,000 families were evicted. 4,000 families became homeless in the month of March. Our partnership with the Redbird Outreach Collaborative, or ROC, allows us to be able to utilize funds from the ESG CARES Act to provide rental assistance to keep families in their homes. Additionally, we have funding for those who are unable to cover lights, gas, and even water bills. For both of these programs, applicants must reside in the city of Dallas. And if you do not live within the Dallas city limits, we have a list of partners on our website that may be able to assist in other areas. To apply, please visit www.faithformula.org. Hello, Friendship West. I'm Deborah Peak Haynes, and I want you to know that God has resources for even in extreme times such as this. This book, Ready and Able, exposed to me by Dr. Jewel Pukram, written by Dr. Jewel Pukram and her colleague, actually will tell us what to do in so many extreme circumstances. For instance, do you have a generator? What type of food should you eat in an emergency? What type of foods can help build your immune system? And so, so much more. So please go to friendshipwest.org and search for our store and download this book today. It will be so helpful. Proceeds will go to Friendship West and we want you to know that we're always here looking for ways to give you information so that you can be safe, you can be successful, and you can have faith and hope even in extreme times as this. Please download Ready and Able on friendshipwest.org in our store. Thank you so much. from the Justice Ministry here at Friendship West Baptist Church. I want to do a quick check-in with all of you who may have participated in this past primary election season. Listen, we know last summer the Texas legislature passed a number of voter suppression laws, voter suppression laws that we feel uh, can be a hindrance to many voters here in the state of Texas. And so what we simply want to do is do a check-in with you. Listen, if you had any issues, if you encountered any problems when you tried to vote in this pri last primary election season, we want to hear from you. We want to hear your story. We want to hear your narrative. We want to hear if you were encountered any problems at the polling location or if you had issues receiving your mail-in ballot or having your mail-in ballot rejected. We want to hear from you. We want to track that. We want to document some of the ways in which you may have had some issues as you tried to cast your vote in this past primary election season. So if you have, have a story to tell, want us to know about anything related to the last primary election season, email us at justice at friendshipwest.org. That's justice at friendshipwest.org. Don't call us. We want you to email it and type out. Let us know um, what issues you may have encountered so we can document that so we can better see how we can correct any issues that may have happened at the poll so that when we hit the November election season, we want to make sure that everyone is fully aware of how to go in, cast your ballot, fix any kinks that may be there, and to make sure we all are able to access the ballot and have access to a free and fair elections here in the state of Texas. So once again, if you voted in the primary election this past March, we want to make sure that you reach out to us. Let us know if you had any issues, any problems, any kind of barriers to voting in the primary election season. We want to hear your story. Please email us at justice at friendshipwest.org. We look forward to continuing to do our part in terms of voter engagement and being in touch with the voters to make sure that we all have an easy process when it comes to participating in this electoral process. Your vote is precious, your vote is powerful, and your vote is indeed your voice.
Yeah, that's what we hope you do. Experience our great God for yourself at FWBC. God bless you. I'm Frederick Douglass Haynes III. So excited, I can't even hide it, to welcome you to another edition of Theology Matters. Now, this edition of Theology Matters, I'm going to basically uh, spend some time unpacking the theology of Mark's gospel. So go ahead, grab your Bibles. I know normally... Uh, we Well, we kind of go back and forth. You know how we roll. Uh, at the beginning of the year, I did a piece on the theology of the gospel according to Matthew, and uh, then uh, February and March and April, uh, we interviewed uh, great geniuses like Aubrey Hendricks and uh, Leah Dunning, and then uh, last month, uh, my boy from Memphis, Tennessee, his name is escaping me right now, and he killed me, but bottom line is that we had a powerful conversation around his great book uh, on Albert Clegg, and so I thank God for uh, Theology Matters, because it does, and since Theology Matters, it's very important uh, that we have a directed study, conversation, uh, as often as possible, and uh, under the leadership of Pastor Durr, uh, we are doing this at least once a month, and so thank you, Pastor Durr, uh, again for your leadership. Today, uh, I want to unpack the theology of the gospel according to Mark under the umbrella of our month theme. Our theme for the month, of course, is call to order you know, as if getting yourself together, hold your head, guard your heart. I think that's from Big Sean. And so uh, we are recognizing the importance of mental health. It's a real thing. And we want you to guard your heart, hold your head. We want you to to, to recognize how important this is within the context of the body of Christ. Uh, Jesus does not ignore mental health. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Paul even piggybacks on Jesus and says, be anxious for nothing, but by everything with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God. God that passeth all understanding will guard your heart. There it is, and mine through Christ Jesus. And so, so this month, we want to unpack that, but Mark goes beyond uh, this month. And so it's going to be exciting. Please, everything, whatever else you do, uh, notify people right now, uh, share, uh, like, uh, I'm sure I'm using the, the wrong terminology, but the bottom line is I'm giving you time to let people join our study tonight because we're jumping right off into it, and I'm so hyped. Thank you. Subscribe, like, share, click the notification bell. Do all of that stuff, and that will help us uh, be a blessing to you. So please, uh, let's go to God in prayer and get ready uh, to hear from God this night. Uh, as we call to order, as we get everything together, guarding our heart, holding our head. God, thank you so much for the gift of life. We thank you and praise you for peace of mind. We thank you and praise you that you are a heart fixer and a mind regulator. And now in the matchless name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, we ask that you would feel free to speak to us you know exactly how we feel, what we're thinking, where we are mentally, emotionally. We need a word from you. We need to hear from you. So please speak. I'm available to be used as your instrument. We lift all of this up to you in the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and hallelujah. Check this. Uh, we're walking through the gospel according to Mark uh, for this trimester, and I want to tonight... Uh, lift up what I call uh, a theology of Mark. I'm not going to be, uh, what, arrogant and say this is the theology of Mark uh, because I am finite and we are dealing with what? The wisdom of an infinite God, the word of an infinite God. And so uh, with that being the case, I want to see uh, and share uh, what it is I believe God has revealed to me uh, as it relates to the, the or a theology of the gospel according to Mark. And, and I want to suggest that this theology 
uh, is so powerful because it speaks to God being a heart fixer and a mind regulator. And this is a theology for the traumatized and the disinherited. The theology for it, for the traumatized and the disinherited. I begin uh, by simply saying that if you want to get an idea of the audience being addressed by this gospel, the original audience, and, and scholars have come to the conclusion that this gospel, according to Mark, uh, was, was, was composed between 66 and 70 of the common era. Uh, some 30 years after the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of the Prince of Peace, Jesus the Christ. And, 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 and so you're talking about, what, three decades later, Mark's gospel comes to bear, uh, comes to be. And when Mark's gospel came to be, I want you to understand that it was a tense terrifying, traumatizing time for the audience that Mark is addressing. These are Jewish Christians in Rome. Don't forget that, okay, because text must always address context. Text out of context become a pretext that con people uh, we often share. And so, so don't forget, please keep in mind that Mark is addressing Jewish Christians who were living in Rome. It's the belly of the beast. And this is during the time of the Roman Jewish war. If you want an up-to-date understanding of what that looked like, the Roman Jewish war took place between 66 and 70. And please understand, this particular war was in a real sense like the war going on in Ukraine. But imagine this. It's a Jew Jewish Roman war going on uh, in uh, Israel, in Palestine, and it's very much akin to what's been happening along the Russian-Ukrainian border as this mighty military invades a small country in order to take it over, suppress it, uh, oppress it, but, but, but that's bad enough. You'll agree with me, that's bad enough. But don't forget that it came out early on when Russia was invading Ukraine and there were Ukrainians trying to exit the country that black people in that area, Africans trying to exit, were met with what? Discrimination in the midst of war. And so it's not just the Ukrainians, but those who are black who are being treated even worse than the Ukrainians. That's the metaphor. That, that's a perfect, sad, tragic metaphor for what the Jewish Christians in Rome were experiencing between 66 and 70 of the Common Era. The Roman military, with all of its might, the most powerful military on the planet, please don't forget that, they have invaded Palestine in order to suppress, in order to take over a people who were rising up in rebellion against Roman occupation and oppression. And so Mark's gospel is initially received by those suffering the trauma of Roman persecution here it is, either by personal experience or they had seen others brutally victimized by the empire. What do I mean like by that? I mean, take for example, you don't have to be Ahmad Arbery's mother to have seen the video clip of Ahmad Arbery being hunted down by the racist terrorist there in Georgia. Uh, and I'm not saying, of course, that they had video clips, but I am saying that what Rome would do, just as any empire, including this empire, is done in history, and that is whenever they wanted to send a message to individuals who would think about rising up in rebellion, they always ensured, here it is, that the death, the crucifixions, the lynchings were always matters of public consumption. And so, so that's why it was nothing to see what a line of crosses 
where crucifixions had taken place in areas colonized by the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was doing everything they could uh, to control those areas that they had colonized. And so, so understand that Mark is writing a people who are catching hell. Mark is writing a people who are going through it. It is vicious. It is horrible. And so it's, it's this congregation that receives the gospel according to Mark. I've quoted often for you uh, that brilliant biblical scholar, uh, Dr. Uh, my God, my name, my, my, my brain fog is really kicking in tonight, but, but Jerome Ross, that's right, Dr. Jerome Ross talks about the fact that when you read the Bible, uh, the audiences addressed in Scripture were audiences that were under one of six oppressions, Egyptian oppression, and we know about that. Uh, per, uh, 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 Babylonian oppression, we know about that. Assyrian oppression, Persian, Grecian, and Roman oppression. And the New Testament, the Greek New Testament, was addressed to a people who were living under Roman occupation and oppression. And again, Mark is writing Jewish Christians in the belly of the beast, right there in Rome, catching hell, in the midst of a Jewish-Roman war that really wasn't much of a war because uh, the Jewish Palestinians did not have access to the military technology of the Roman Empire. And so it's really a smackdown, as it were. That is what is going on, and that is the context that that Mark writes. And so it's very important to understand that because there's, there's, there, there's language, there's a message that Mark uses to reach the people uh, as he narrates, as it were, uh, the liberating love and life and legacy of heaven's hero, earth's emancipator, our Lord and liberator, Jesus the Christ. And so, so I want to uh, go ahead and just, just begin, and please put that slide back up, because again, it's a traumatized and disinherited uh, audience. Uh, I think it's Frank Thomas uh, who writes about trauma uh, as the tragic events you deal with by yourself. It's really a powerful picture because he speaks of the fact that, yeah, others may be around you, but you are dealing in a unique and personal, even private way with those tragic events, and you're dealing with it by yourself. It's like no one talks to you about it, and you're left all by yourself. And so Mark is addressing an audience that is traumatized, but also disinherited. And, and if you've been hanging around Friendship West, you already know where I'm going, uh, because one of the classic books that deals with the concept of being disinherited is that classic by Howard Thurman. Martin Luther King Jr. carried two books with him every where in his travels, the Bible and Howard Thurman's classic, Jesus and the Disinherited, just a powerful book. And one of the things that he talks about repeatedly in that book as he is addressing a question that came to him when he was traveling in India and someone noting that he's black from America lifts up the fact, you know, how is it that black people in America can love Jesus, follow Jesus, knowing that so much has been done to black people by way of weaponizing Christianity as a tool of oppression in the name of Jesus. It's been done. And Howard Thurman responds, as it were, with what we've come to read as Jesus and the disinherited, just a powerful piece. And so, so Mark is addressing a people who are not only traumatized, but understand they are disinherited. They identify with what Howard Thurman spoke about when he spoke about a people who stood at a moment in time with their backs against the wall. Do you get the picture? Your back is against the wall and you're being pummeled by oppression pummeled by microaggressions, pummeled by everything that is dehumanizing you and letting you know that you are less than and not equal to. And so it's very important for us to understand 
when you read the gospel according to Mark. Mark the writer is addressing, Mark the preacher is addressing a traumatized and disinherited audience. You're talking about an audience that every day was an existential hell. And that's why Judy Fentress Williams writes, and she has a wonderful book called Holy Imagination. As a matter of fact, if you are serious about reading the whole Bible, please pick up the book by Judy Fentress Williams entitled Holy Imagination. Dr. Durr is always giving us books to read. Listen, this is a book that you've got to have. I know we have classes here at the church where they're going through the whole Bible. Listen, don't you do it without Judy Fentress Williams' uh, Holy Imagination. It's absolutely powerful. She writes as she goes through literally the whole Bible, but when she comes to Mark, she writes, some scholars argue Mark was written for survivors who saved the their lives at great cost, perhaps by hiding or denying Christ. Don't hate on them. Don't judge them. I've given you what? The setting, the contextual setting that they found themselves in, very much alike and akin to those who find themselves in Ukraine, not just Ukraine, Ukrainians, but Africans in Ukraine trying to escape the terror and trauma. And even as they are escaping, they are being dissed, discriminated against and disinherited. And what kind of gospel is going to speak to you when you're in that kind of situation? And so that is why, again, Judy Fentress Williams talks about those scholars who basically said these persons in Mark were survivors, survivors of an existential hell, and many of them had survived because they had either hid from the Roman Empire or they had actually denied their relationship with Jesus Christ because they were doing everything in their power. It's just like, watch this, what we have tried to teach our young people. When you have an encounter with a police officer, your first priority is what? Survive. Make sure you survive. And so we see in the gospel according to Mark this trauma, it's seen repeatedly. Uh, the, the, the symbolism is so profound. Uh, we preached a few Sundays ago uh, about this theme of trauma in uh, chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, where notice, if you will, that Jesus gets baptized. He gets baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. The heaven open up. God speaks, says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, but wait, I'm not even done because the Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove. You have the triune God gathered together there in the Jordan, at the Jordan River. And the book lets us know it's a magical, magnificent, and moving moment. But hold on. Immediately, the Bible says Jesus is is driven by the Spirit into the wilderness where there he is tempted by Satan relentlessly, repeatedly for 40 days and for 40 nights. I'm not even done. And he was with the wild beast there. So he's in the wilderness in a wild place with wild beasts every day, relentlessly, repeatedly being tempted by Satan. And here's what's really a trip is that the book lets us know he had a moment in the Jordan where God spoke, the Spirit descends upon the Son of God, and God affirms, this is my boy in whom I'm well pleased. One moment in the Jordan and 40 days of catching hell. The people receiving this gospel, they feel that. It's like, huh? So Jesus can relate to us because he had one moment of heaven opening and 40 days of catching nonstop hell. But that's not all. You check out chapter 1, verses 21 and 28, and you'll discover it, it keeps on happening because the book lets us know there in chapter 1, beginning at verse 28, or verse 21, rather, I'm sorry, uh, Jesus goes uh, to uh, the synagogue, and there in church, he discovers uh, that a demon uh, is just 
disrupting everything. You ever been to church and, and something demonic broke out? Well, that happened uh, in the text. It's got to be real traumatic for you to go to the synagogue. You're going there to worship, to hear from God, and all of a sudden, a demon starts talking. A devil disrupts everything you're looking forward to. That can happen, and I promise you, that can be downright traumatic. And so that happens in chapter 1, uh, verses 21 through 28, and then in chapter 1, verses 40 through 45, we see a leper who lives every day disinherited because of his skin. His skin causes him to be treated in such a way that he's disinherited. And I ain't even got to spend no time really applying that because we all know what that feels like and what that means. And so because of something biological, this leper has experienced not only the trauma of life changing disruptively for him, for the worst, but now he is disinherited and must live in a leper colony. And the only way that he can exit the colony, he has to holler out every day, everywhere he goes, unclean, unclean. He's got to speak from his mouth the condition that has taken over his life. How jacked up is that? Because we all know the Bible says that there is power of life or death in the tongue. And so if you're speaking negatively, neg negatively about yourself constantly, and that's what this leper is doing negatively, constantly, saying about himself as he's approaching people, unclean, unclean. That's what he's doing. But guess what? He shifts gears because he hears that Jesus is around and the book lets us know. He says to Jesus, uh, here's the deal. If you will, you can make me clean. If you want to, you can deliver me. You can set me free. And so again, and I could just call the roll. You see right there, uh, Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And, and not just Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, where there is a man with a withered hand. Something traumatic had happened to him that left his hand withered. And now he's in the synagogue on the Sabbath, bringing his trauma to church. And then chapter 4, verses 35 through 41, Pastor Durr tore it up last week talking about that passage where the storm broke out. It's a stress storm as it were. And guess what? It's traumatic because in biblical antiquity, the people of God, they feared the water and equated the water with chaos. And so you're talking about trauma. And then chapter 6, verses 14 through 29, it tells the story of John the Baptist speaking truth to power. And as a consequence, he gets his head cut off. Imagine the trauma of the followers of John the Baptist. John chapter 6, verses 45 through 52. I mean, it just keeps on going where there is trauma on top of trauma in the gospel according to Mark. And then we can't even get to the what? Passion crucifixion narratives because they again reflect trauma at its worst because the lynching, the crucifixion that was done by the Roman Empire, it was done in order to send a message, to send a message to any would-be revolutionaries. You want to rise up in rebellion against Rome? This is what will happen to you. It was vicious. It was cruel. It was inhumane. It was traumatic. It was traumatic. I don't want you to miss that. It was traumatic. And so, so Mark is writing a people who've known trauma, who are experiencing trauma, who are disinherited. But what Mark does that is so powerful, Mark preaches exactly where they are and lets them know, to quote Stacy Floyd Thomas, Christ is where the crisis is. Is. I love that so much because the bottom line is for someone who is tuned in, I got some amazing news for you. If you were in a traumatic crisis and you're wondering how am I going to make it through all of this, I got some good news. Christ is where the crisis is for someone who finds themselves traumatized and continuously being triggered by what has happened in the past that still haunts you in the present. Christ is where the crisis 
crisis is. And so please hit the next slide because the beautiful thing is Mark is a radicalizing and empowering gospel for the traumatized and the disinherited. That is, as far as I'm concerned, y'all, the shout of the gospel according to Mark. And that is when you read Mark's gospel, keeping in mind the traumatizing context for the disinherited, I've tried to share with you, you'll discover Mark is a book that radicalized the people of God to become radicalized disciples, empowered, watch this, in spite of being traumatized and in spite of their disinherited status. This really gets me right here. I think it's uh, uh, a brilliant sister, amazing sister. Kelly Brown Douglas talks about the crucifying realities of black death that we often begin in. But when you know Jesus for yourself, here's the good news. You can navigate the crucifying realities of black death knowing you've got a resurrection hope that will, here it is, empower the traumatized as they navigate black life in a country that is in too many instances structured in a hierarchical fashion to disvalue, to demean, and disinherit it. But the good news is we serve a Savior who identifies with all of this. There's a wonderful, another book I want to recommend, Say to This Mountain, which is an un packing of uh, Chad Meyer's book, Binding the Strong Man, which is a deep scholarly treatise, a political reading of the gospel according to Mark. Say to this mountain, breaks it down where late persons get it in an easy way. But here's what, what, what is said in this, in the interpretation. There are, I love this, there are two kinds of stories and two kinds of readers. Don't miss this. One kind of story aspires only to entertain or to distract its audience. All of us can relate. I'll just go ahead and testify. Every now and then, I'm asked, why are you watching this whatever? And, and my response is because it is amusement. Amusement. Watch me shout you. Uh, but don't shout because this is good. Amusement. Have you ever been to an amusement park? Have you ever been amused? Etymologically, break down the word amuse. Muse, M-U-S-E. Muse means to ponder, to think, to reflect. If you put what? The prefix A in front of muse, it literally wipes it out and says, in essence, you're no longer musing. You're not thinking. You're not pondering. You're not reflecting. Uh, it's the prefix that basically cancels it, a muse. And so there are two kinds of stories. So I go to the movies. I want to be amused, distracted. I'm not there to think. I'm there to do anything but reflect. I'm there to do anything but think. I'm watching certain TV shows. Listen, amuse me. That's what I want because life, watch this, we're subjected to so many microaggressions, so many psychic attacks that you will find yourself, again, my boy puts it this way, Black Austin and all of that, will cause you to take some time or guess what? I need to be amused, distracted. So there are stories that there is entertainment that amuses us, distracts us. And that means what? We are passive spectators, just, just receiving what story is being told to us. We're not engaging it intellectually. We're just chilling, being a Amused, all right? Now, but the other kind of story intends to what? Change its audience. It invites, here it is, spectators to become spec actors. Don't miss your shout. A spectator just watches. A spec actor is engaged, enlightened, edified, equipped, 
emancipated and empowered in such a way that now they are ready to act on the story and the revelation that has come to them as a result of it. Spec actors are open to allowing the story to challenge their own life scripts to let the story read them. That's the B-I-B-L-E. When you read the Bible, when you read the gospel according to Mark, you don't read it as a spectator. You read it as a spec actor. And as a spec actor, you're saying, I'm not just allowing the Bible. I'm not just reading the Bible. I want the Bible to read me. Boom. Preach, Freddie Haynes. I'm not trying to preach. Just trying to teach. So the gospel of Mark is a first century manifesto of radical Christian discipleship. That's the story of the gospel according to Mark. It beckons readers. Read chapter 4, verse 9. Here it, I, I'm going to jump to it right quick because I want you all to not think I'm making any of this up. Mark chapter 4, verse 9 is very powerful. Uh, Jesus gives a parable. He's teaching the multitude about a sower who went out to sow. Uh, some fell by the wayside. Fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Some fell on stony ground and not much earth. Others, and, and, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. Some fell among thorns and got choked. Some fell on good ground and some, and as a consequence, they reaped some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Here it is. And Jesus says in verse 9, what? He or she that has ears to hear, let them hear. Are y'all getting that? So the gospel according to Mark ain't about you being a spectator. It's about you being a spec actor. When you read this gospel, Mark's gospel says, I want you to act on what it is you are hearing, what it is you are reading. And then chapter 10, verse 51, it gets me again because the text says, and Jesus answered and said to him, what would you that I should do unto you? The blind person said, unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Jesus said, go your way. Uh, your faith have made you whole. Immediately he received his sight, followed Jesus along the way. Here it is. He sees and follows. I don't just get healed and delivered by Jesus, but now that I see, I'm going to follow Jesus. And so Mark is a radicalizing gospel. And it's radically designed to produce results in our lives. And the results in our lives are that we what? Hear, see, and follow. I like that. Hit the next slide for me, please. I think that that's kind of hot. So when you read the gospel according to Mark, and let's go to verse 1. Turn in your Bibles to verse 1, and, and let's just get ready to shout. Uh, I maintain verse 1 which is the what? What we learn in English class. It's the topic sentence, okay? I'll read to you the topic sentence of the gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verse 1. It says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I maintain that when the Jewish Christian audience there in the belly of the beast in Rome read that opening verse of the book. They read it, and, and listen, this is one of those sermons they either, because again, it was either read or it was orally presented, and, and I need to go ahead and say, just to be honest in terms of uh, intellectual integrity, uh, this gospel was first delivered uh, orally. Okay, it was first delivered orally, and then, of course, uh, comes along the uh, written uh, scripts. But so the first audience, they hear this, and the reason that scholars agree it was delivered orally is because in the original language, you often see the conjunction and uh, that connects. It's a fast-moving gospel, and I'll talk about that in a matter of moments. But chapter 1, verse 1, this audience, they just, they shout, on the topic sentence. 
I don't know if you've if you ever, ever heard a sermon where the first line of the sermon just sent you over the edge. That's exactly in my anointed imagination what I believed happened to the people of God when they heard this first verse, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, because in essence it says this is a new beginning pointing toward a victorious future out of chaos. Let's look at it. The beginning, I'll start right there. The beginning, the word beginning in the original language, watch this. It was a word that the people of God, again, it's a Jewish Christian audience in Rome, and here it is. They immediately hear the word beginning, and they flash back to the Hebrew Bible. Where in the Hebrew Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the Hebrew, my Hebrew professor says it reads like this. Uh, uh, when God began creating the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. That, now, now I, I know what ours often says, what, in the beginning God created the heavens? No, no, no. In the Hebrew, most Hebrew scholars says it begins like this. When God began creating the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form. So when God began doing the creating of all that is, it was chaotic, okay? God started the whole creation process dealing with chaos, earth without form and void. Darkness covers the face of the deep. It's a chaotic time. That's what God starts with. God starts with chaos, but here is the shout. The shout is God starts with chaos, but then God, in the beginning, goes to talking. And once God starts talking in this word-activated universe, let there be, let there be, let there be. Before you know it, chaos has to give way to cosmos. Disorder and dysfunction give way to a divine design. And so when the people of God in the belly of the beast living through an existential hell right there in Rome find themselves in the chaos and trauma of Rome hearing the first verse of the gospel according to Mark and here's what they hear, the beginning and their minds race back to Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and now they are saying, the God of new beginnings is showing up in Jesus Christ and the same God that brought cosmos out of chaos, a divine design out of disorder and dysfunction, that God is now showing up in Jesus Christ, the beginning of the gospel. Gospel. Break down the word gospel. The word gospel broken down, here it is, is God spell. I'm under the spell of God. And the spell of God has the power to change lives and situations. So the beginning of the God spell. Now, the gospel, see, one of the things that has happened, and it's, it's just one of the saddest things, is that whenever you connect empire to a faith, an empire weaponizes faith or religion in order to oppress and further their agenda, empire invariably is going to what? Sanitize, deodorize, uh, de-radicalize that religion, that faith. And that's exactly what's been done, sadly, to the Christian faith. And when you think about what, white evangelicalism, when you think about the marriage of uh, Christianity to slavery, when you think about how, what, the Christian church showed this country how to, what, operate in a segregated fashion. Do you know before Plessy versus Ferguson legalized Jim and Jane Crow segregation and second class citizenship for black people? They had learned how to do it from white churches. White churches taught that. And so here's the deal. Here's the deal. When you uh, put religion in bed with empire, 
you always make sure that religion, here it is, is a weapon of the empire as opposed to that which liberates the oppressed from that empire. Please don't miss this. And so the gospel means you're under the spell of God. It changes your life. It changes your situation. And you know what Mark is doing? It's so cold. Mark is so amazing because Mark basically says, I'm going to take Roman propaganda, baptize it, and use it for liberation and empowerment. Here's what would happen in biblical antiquity. News of a military victory on the edges of the empire where, you know, some colonized era area had decided to rise up in rebellion. Rome sends their military. The military uh, is able to defeat that uh, area, that colonized area, news gets back and it's called what? Euangelion. Good news, glad tidings, gospel, the evangel. I don't want y'all to miss this because what Mark is doing, oh my God, Mark has decided I'm going to birth a new literary genre and use the language of the oppressor in order to liberate and empower those who are oppressed. And so here it is. Imagine this, news of a military victory, and it happened, and, and, and it's really, I mean, if, if we're going to be fully honest, it didn't even start in Rome. It began, uh, Isaiah says, chapter 52, Chapter 52, verses 7 through 10, it says, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, glad tidings, the gospel from afar. What was the gospel? The gospel, the good news, was that in, in that instance, in that instance, Babylon had been defeated. And when Babylon got defeated, the runner starts running. The runner is running back with the news that Babylon has been defeated. Therefore, the people of God who were under Babylonian captivity were now set free. So the gospel, in terms of its original context and meaning, it has everything to do with a concrete liberation from a real situation in life that was downright oppressive. Now, let me just hang out right here because the sad reality is a whitenized gospel, a Europeanized gospel, a whitewashed gospel does not want at all there to be an understanding that gospel has everything to do with setting the captives free, everything to do with a victory over oppressors and oppression. If that is what the gospel is, then the gospel is not just, watch this, changing me on the inside, and it does that, but the gospel changes me on the inside while at the same time empowering me as it changes the oppression oppressive world around me on the outside. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel that Mark is talking about. So Mark purposely and subversively uses language of the empire to announce the victory. Here it is, an ascension to the throne of another empire and emperor. Because that's the other, that's the other good news or glad tidings or euangelion. When, 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 whenever Watch this, an emperor died and a new emperor ascended to the throne. It was considered, here it is, glad tidings, good news. A new emperor is running things. And so when Mark says the beginning, here it is, cosmos out of chaos, divine design out of disorder and dysfunction, the beginning of the good news, here it is. The good news is that Rome, there's another emperor. He's heaven's hero, earth's emancipator, our Lord and liberator. And so it's very important to understand that gospel is liberating. Gospel at its best is, is that spell of God that changes your life and my life 
but also liberates us from oppressive context and situations. Man, I'm almost done uh, with my time, and I got so much more word left. So let me kind of rush through the rest of this. Uh, but, but, it's, but Judy Fentress Williams also writes, when the good news was proclaimed, it was an act of resistance against these worldly powers of oppression. The proclamation of the gospel was a subversive act. It restructured the world created by the oppressive empire through, here it is, assigning new identities. Stop right there. New identities, who you are in Christ, because you always understand that it's your sense of identity that births liberating possibilities so you can live out your date with destiny. And so it assigns new identities. Look at the new identity that we are given. We are children of the Most High God. That's a new identity. When you see yourself differently, you act differently, and you are no longer under the control, the oppressive control of the gaze. That's what W.E.B. Du Bois called it. You no longer are controlled by the gaze, but instead, your new identity in Christ. I'll unpack that in just a moment. And you acknowledge that there is what? An alternative kingdom. There's an alternative kingdom. Next slide, please. A theology. So, 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 so this radicalizing that goes on that we're talking about, when we talk about the radicalizing and empowering message of the gospel of Mark for those who are traumatized and disinherited, uh, what does that theology look like? It looks like this. It looks like, to begin, a theology of urgency in a state of emergency. The Greek word is euthis, euthis, and the Greek word euthis, uh, you see it uh, in King James uh, translation. You, you, you read it, those of you old school have always heard this, and straightway, and straightway, and straight, and straightway. And more modern translations say what? Immediately, because it's almost as if Jesus is saying, you know what, I got three years to handle up on all of this, and so I don't have time to play games. I don't have time to chill. Uh, this is a, what, a theology of urgency in the context of a state of emergency. I hope by now you know what that state of emergency is that Mark is preaching about. When Mark is preaching this gospel, Mark is basically saying, here it is, I get the state of emergency. You're catching hell. It's an existential hell. You're being, you're being crucified. You're being persecuted. You're catching all kind of hell, and you're disinherited, treated as second-class citizens, so you're traumatized and disinherited. Well, let's look at our Savior and how the Savior operated. The Savior operated with a sense of urgency in a state of emergency. Here, I'll drop it on you right quick. Please hear that with God, with Jesus Christ as Lord, liberate of your life, Jesus basically is operating with a sense of urgency as it relates to your situation, my situation, and the state of the world as we find ourselves in. I had to drop that on you. Why? Because all too often I feel in my own human impatience like, God, like, what's taking you so long? What's up? And God lets me know through Mark's gospel, I'm moving with a sense of of urgency that the forces of injustice even operated with. But my sense of urgency is also at work. So read chapter 1, verse 18, chapter 1, verse 21, chapter 5, verse 29, chapter 5, verse 42. Just read those passages there and you'll see repeatedly, straightway or immediately. Let me just give you a few of them because this is Bible study. And so what it says, and what is it? Verse 18 of chapter 1, uh, that Jesus calls uh, Peter, James, John, Andrew, and when he calls them, text says, immediately they put down their nets and followed him. Mark wants us to know there's a sense of urgency in responding to this message. What was the message? And I don't have time to unpack all of this, but when Jesus says, come after me and I'll make you what? Fishers of people. I got to help you because one of the things that has happened in the whitewashing of the gospel, the deodorizing and the, and, and the sanitizing of the gospel is that this whole concept of being a fisher of people 
has been deodorized. When you read it in Ezekiel, Amos, and Jeremiah, those three prophets all address the metaphor that Jesus uses right here, and it had to do with overcoming oppression. I, I, I know what you've been told. You've been told about what? Soul winning. That is not what the original audience heard when they heard Jesus say that he said to Peter, James, John, Andrew, come after me, I'll make you fishers of people. They heard what was said in Amos chapter 4, verse 2. They heard what was said in Ezekiel. Uh, oh, my, I forgot the text. I have to get it back to you. But Ezekiel and Jeremiah, because in all three of those settings, when fishers of persons or fish hooks is used, it has to do with overthrowing oppression. Depression. Please don't miss that, okay? And Jesus did it with a sense of urgency, and they followed him with a sense of urgency. He goes into the synagogue, what, immediately on the Sabbath. That's verse 21. And then skipping over to chapter 5, verse 29, we see another sense of urgency right there in a state of emergency because the text says that a woman with an issue of blood, here it is, she touches him immediately. She is healed. There there's something about our Savior who has a sense of urgency when we find ourselves experiencing oppression. And even again, the end of the gospel, according to Mark, over and over, they immediately uh, took him from judgment hall to judgment hall. Immediately, he was crucified. So there's a sense of urgency. Next slide, please. A theology of urgency in a state of emergency, but also there's a theology of self-empowerment for the disempowered. Chapter 5, verse 34 of Mark is so powerful because we know the story of the woman who for 12 years had an issue that imprisoned her. But this woman decides, I'm going to engage in civil disobedience because I've heard there's a healer are going around. There's a great physician. I'm not going to do what the law wants me to do and stay home and, 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 and not in public. I'm going to touch the hem of his garment because if I just touch his hem, I will be made whole. And the text says she does it. Look what Jesus says in verse 34. Jesus says, daughter, it's a wonderful term of endearment that, that what? increases her sense of value. It, oh, here it is. It goes back to my prior point about the identity that she now has imputed onto her. She is daughter. Daughter, here it is. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith did this. Don't you love that? Because Jesus recognizes that if we just serve a God, who always does for us, does for us, does for us, instead of doing something within us or inspiring something within us that causes us to, what, assume agency, take our healing, our empowerment, our transformation in our own hands. Jesus commends her and says, your faith made you whole. You got the power. You are self-empowered, which is the theme of this trimester, self-empowerment. Jesus says it takes faith, faith in a power greater than you. And that faith in the power greater than you self-empowers you. And then Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52, that's Bartimaeus. Jesus stops what he's doing because Bartimaeus is upsetting the crowd because he's yelling out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the book says Jesus stops. The crowd is trying to shush him, shut him up. And Bartimaeus says, y'all shut me up all you want to. I'm going to get louder. The louder you shut me up, the louder I'm going to holler because you don't know like I know what I need and you don't know like I know what this great physician can do for me. He has an eye-opening experience. And Jesus says, well, here it is. Your faith has made you whole. What was his faith? His faith was relentless determination. His faith was, you ain't going to make me quit just because the crowd wants me to stop. I'm not going to stop. And he hollers out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. And Jesus says, your faith has made you whole. That's self-empowerment. Next slide. Next slide. 
a theology that gets meaning out of traumatizing evil and oppression. Fentress Williams, again, get the book. Some describe the Gospel of Mark as a passion narrative with a long introduction because it's basically about what happened when Jesus got lynched, the passion of the Christ, as it were. If you want to know who this Jesus is, look to the account of his suffering and death. It is in this moment that his identity becomes clear. In this moment, we discover the crucifixion of Christ is the defining moment and event, not only for Jesus, but for this community familiar with persecution. They know being in, being disinherited. They know trauma. They know all of that. But every time they hear this story, their identity is affirmed because Judy Fentress Williams, she says what Mark wants them to know is that the identity of the Savior you worship, that identity... And here's the point she's making, because y'all know that there was this messianic secret all throughout the gospel where Jesus said, uh, don't you tell this to nobody. I just preached Sunday from Mark chapter 5 uh, with the little girl, 12 years old, who died. And the book says, when Jesus raised her from the dead, Jesus said, shh, don't you tell nobody. And all throughout the text, that's what he's doing. But then Fentress Williams says it's in the crucifixion that his identity is fully unveiled in the passion. His, his identity, who he is, is affirmed. Who he is comes out in the context of suffering. Y'all know, I, I, I hate to say it, but that's just kind of the way it is, is that God doesn't intentionally send us through hell to bring who we are out, but God says what I will do, the hell you people put you through, they're going to end up seeing the real you as a result of what you've been through. The real you is going to come out because I've discovered in this life, when you squeeze something, whatever is in it comes out of it. That was good. If trauma and the stone don't stop you, finally, a cliffhanger lets you know that the story doesn't end with death. If y'all know how Mark's gospel end, ends, you already know where I'm going. Chapter 16, verse 1 through 8, which is really, according to many scholars, of verse 1 through 9, that's the end of Mark's gospel. They added verses 9 through 20, I should say, uh, later on, uh, but it basically ends with a cliffhanger. And y'all know what a cliffhanger is. The cliffhanger basically in Mark's gospel is if the stone doesn't stop you because the women are going to the stone and they're going to embalm the dead body of Jesus, but they're wondering amongst themselves, how are we going to roll the stone away? Because stone was too big for them to roll away themselves. How are we going to roll the stone away? How are we going to roll the stone away? But Charles G. Adams says in a sermon, don't let the stone stop you. Even while they are speaking of the overwhelming obstacle that was between them and their objective, they kept on going to the tomb because they did not let the stone stop them. And that's the word I give to everyone. Don't, y'all, don't let the stone stop you. Don't let the stone of oppression stop you. Don't let the stone of overwhelming odds and obstacles stop you. You keep on going. And when you get where you're going, you'll discover if you look up that everything you've been worried about, God has already dealt with what you've been trying to figure out God has already worked out. Don't let the stone stop you. That's the theology of the gospel according to Mark that will help you to hold your head and guard your heart. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this good news. Thank you for this good news that works in real world context. Contexts that are stressful, oppressive, that wear us down. But we thank you that Mark has a message for us. We thank you for this radicalizing, empowering message so we can guard our hearts and hold our heads. And I pray your blessings now upon all of those experiencing disorder and dysfunction. God, in Jesus' name, I pray for healing. In Jesus' name, I pray that you will give them that peace that passeth all understanding and guard their heart and mind through Christ Jesus. And then, God, I pray for you to save those who are lost, lost in themselves, 
lost in situations, lost in systems and structures. God, save, liberate, heal in the name of Jesus. And then those who you have already touched and you know, God, that you want them connected to our church family, speak to them in Jesus' name. Listen, if you tuned in and you're feeling this, and you know you need to know this Savior who's a heart fixer and a mind regulator. I want you right now to dial that number, 469-498-0210. Do it right now. You can email us at joinus at friendshipwest.org. But do it right now. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Don't vacillate. God is speaking. God's word is, has, has been delivered. So won't you right now dial that number. Give your life to Christ. This Christ who is a heart fixer and a mind regulator. You need a savior. And if you're saying, hey, but I'd like to join this church, we'd love to have you. I'd love to be your pastor. So won't you right now, go ahead, dial that number, 469-498-0210. We've got ministers of the gospel who want to minister to you. And you can join church. You can also be prayed for because perhaps your whole thing has been as, as the word has been taught tonight. Yeah, I, 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 I feel that. I, I, I feel the predicament of Mark's audience. I'm tired of this existential hell I'm dealing with. I'm tired of feeling traumatized and treated as a second-class citizen. If that's you, dial that number. Email us. Join us at friendshipwest.org. God bless you. And we'll be more than glad to have you. Listen, it's offering time. We serve a generous God. God has been so good. I know God has been good to you. God's been so amazingly good to me. And that's why I can't help but try to outgive God. I try to outgive God. It never works because you can't be God's given no matter how you try. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. You can text to give. Text to give right there. Uh, 972 200 9419. Text FWBC2 that number, and then of course, you know what to do in terms of the amount you're going to give. You can scan to give. You see the code right there? Scan, very safe vehicle to give. The Givelify app, download the Givelify app if you don't have it. If you do have it, search out Friendship West and you can give through that vehicle. Again, safe. You can also give online, friendshipwest.org, our website, the FWBC app. And you know old school, old school, we got those envelopes waiting on you. So you can bring your envelope, you can bring it to the church, you can mail it to the church, 2020 West Wheatland Road, Dallas, Texas, 75232. That's Friendship West Baptist Church, 2020 West Wheatland Road, Dallas, Texas, 75232. God bless you. Thank you to all of you who tuned in or came out yesterday. Paul Quinn College to the ribbon cutting for uh, the Frederick D. Haynes III uh, Global, uh, Haynes Global Preparatory Academy. Powerful day. It was good to see and greet so many of you. Just thank God for the great honor that I know I'm not worthy of, but I guess I'll spend the rest of my life trying to, trying to grow into it. So thank you so much for your support. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Those of you who are in the DF dub and won't be working and you have access uh, to transportation, we look to see you this coming Sunday. If not, you do know that we still are virtual as well as actual because we do both in person and online. So you can either be on your sofa or in the sanctuary and join us for a powerful time of worship as we continue our walk through the gospel according to Mark. God bless you. God keep you. I got to get out of here so I can go check out the Warriors. Uh, Warriors! All right, I know y'all don't. I know where I am. That shout out to my Bay Area people. Yay area! The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause God's face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of God countenance upon you. Grant you peace. Go now in the power. God's Holy Spirit guarding your heart, holding your head with our heart fixer and mind regulator. In Jesus' name, peace. God bless you. We praise God for this impactful experience and for your joining us during it. Check us out on social media and please like, share, and subscribe at Friendship West. 
Then go to www.friendshipwest.org to find out more about this marvelous movement. Find out how to participate through sharing your prayers, sharing your offerings or monetary gifts, or sharing and investing your time volunteering with this difference-making ministry. For you who are viewing as visitors, you can share that you are here by taking time to text FWBIZ to the number 28950. For those who want to, this time that you are visiting to be the last time that you are a visitor, you can become part of our fabulous family of faith, either by calling 469-498-0210 or by emailing join us at friendshipwest.org with your first name, your last name, and your cell number. Either way, we look forward to hearing from you. We're so excited that you are here. Until next time, blessings on you. <laughs>